We introduce a new sermon series entitled um, Recipe for Life, a recipe of life. What we're looking at here over the course of the next uh, eight to ten weeks or so is we're going to be uh, bringing together a number of various disciplines that Paul is going to be talking about, various uh, truths that we need to, to have uh, as exhibited in the life uh, as believers. And today we're going to be looking at the notion of defending truth. It's become increasingly obvious to me that society is struggling in our pursuit to define and live in light of truth. What is true? Uh, what, what can we hold to that uh, or to truth? In fact, there is a, a clear battle being waged upon the participants which stand in the ring. On one corner, we have that of, of popular belief or popular thought, that which, uh, the, which society holds to be true. On the other side, we have a plumb line for truth that is, that is uh, uh, derived and originated from the author of all truth, God himself. And the question the church is having to, to face today, and, and a, a question upon which we're going to have to ultimately decide which participant in this fight we're going to back. What participant are we going to support? Are we going to support popular truth and worldly philosophy, or are we going to support that of God-defined truth, uh, a reality that is, that is brought to us by God himself? Uh, you know, we find this in everyday life, and, and it's certainly a battle in which Paul sees head on in the book of Galatians. And, and we're going to explore that. But before we do that, let's, let's stop and look at a, a contemporary illustration or application of, of how we see this unfolding in our life day by day, moment by moment. Uh, how many of you are fans of the very popular TV show, Duck Dynasty? How many of you watch Duck Dynasty? I am shocked. Our first group, nearly the entire congregation ro- raised their hand. I mean, there were a, uh, a large number of people who, who watched the show. Well, as you know, the show has come under uh, uh, a great deal of scrutiny of late. The family patriarch, Phil, in an interview, shared his beliefs concerning uh, his definition of marriage, among other things. He, he shared and exposed his, his, uh, what he believed the Bible to say concerning marriage and concerning human sexuality. And, and the TV sponsor, A&E, was not in favor of what he had to share. In fact, he, he shared a view that though uh, was said in a way that only Phil could say, as many of you who know him uh, and have followed him, uh, uh, he said it in such a way that, that the TV sponsor decided to pull him off of future airings of the popular hit TV show, Duck Dynasty. Now, the problem is there's a whole lot of people in this, in this uh, world, and, and in particular here in the United States, who watch this show. In fact, there's, there's probably a variety of people who you would not even expect in this room who've yet to admit that they watch the show, who have yet to raise their hand. But, but this show on some levels... Uh, uh, I begin to think about how popular this show is, and I was actually turned on to it by our young people here at the church. They, they asked me to watch it with them one time, and, and uh, i got to be honest with you. I don't understand why I watch it and why it's so popular. I really don't. I don't get it. i, I got to be honest with you. I'm not interested in duck hunting. I'm not. I, 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 I'm just not. How many of you watch Duck Dynasty and yet could honestly say today you have no intention ever of ever getting into duck hunting? Yeah, all of us. Yeah, that's right. Because I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I, I own a duck call at my house, but I hide it because otherwise my children annoy me with it. All right? And they, they walk around and they blow it. I mean, the whole, the whole premise of the show, I, I was driving down the road and I asked myself this day, why... Do people like this show? Why do people? I mean, and it's a it's a massive success. Everybody uh, knows of this show going on, and and um, and the problem that that and it's not necessarily a problem. The reality is, people don't necessarily watch the show because they have an interest in duck calls and or duck hunting. The reality is, people are mesmerized by watching a family who lives on principles and values and truth. They, they like to see the principles upon which they display in their life. Now, mind you this, they have an enormous amount of fun living life, but they live life with a, with a, with a value system and with an ethic and with, with principles upon which people are interested well, therein lies the problem. A&E decides to, to take Phil off the show, 
And 14 plus million people in America began to raise their hands and, and, and raise their voices and say, we're not pleased with this. In fact, you all may have watched, they, they, they took all of the Duck Dynasty stuff off of the shelves at, at places like Cracker Barrel, right? And, and within 24 hours, they had it back up on the shelves saying, wait a second, we thought we were doing what people wanted, and in fact, we realized we didn't do anything that people wanted. Now, now how, if, if you've been following the storyline, it's really captivated me because here's what I think happened. And I think this is a good thing. When you go back and take the last month and, and, and you look at the entire span of work that's happened as a result of all this, here's what I think that one of the conclusions that we can arrive to is this. There's been a sleeping giant awoken in culture today. And finally, what we've come to, 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 to see is that nobody, Really, nobody. You can write this down. Not the left, not the right, not the up, not the down, not the wise, not the foolish. Nobody has a monopoly on free speech or the ability to live a life with convictions. And that's a good thing, friends. What we have finally seen is that if we will just simply stand up and allow our voice to be heard, people will ultimately and finally listen. Now, friends, the church has got to take note of this because, because we find ourselves in a society where, where if it's Phil and, and the Duck Dynasty issue, that's, that's interesting. But Lynn, friends, look across the segment of America today and what you're going to find is that the values upon which he was exposing are values that are under attack in every segment of life today. The definition of marriage, the definition of family, how we are to live our life, what we consider a drug versus what we don't consider our drug, the value of human life, of abortion, euthanasia, on and on and on. We could go on forever about issues that we are facing today as a world. And here's the deal. And what we've learned over the last 30 days is that somebody has to stand up for truth. All right? And it's the church's responsibility. Because the simple truth is this. The fact of the matter is this. Non-Christians are supposed to act like Non-Christians, they are. People who don't have a belief in Almighty God and, and a belief that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that we're to live our life by it, they're not supposed to adhere to biblical truth. Here's the rub, though. The church is supposed to stand up for truth. The church and the believers of Christ and, the, and believers in, in the Almighty Word of God are supposed to, they're charged, they're commissioned to stand up and defend that which is true. And that's kind of where we begin to get into the book of Galatians because, because Paul enters the scene in which some people are coming into the, into the church and they're beginning to, to uh, promote views that are not in congruence with gospel truth. And Paul stands up and says, wait a second, Wait a second. If you're preaching any other gospel than the gospel that I preach, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, if you're preaching any other truth than that truth, then may you be eternally condemned, he says. Because in Paul's mind, there is a right and there is a wrong, and you're either on the side of right or you're wrong right? There is no middle ground. We are trying to make the middle ground the only ground to stand on. And friends, listen, the church must resist the temptation to compromise. The church must resist that temptation. And so as we turn to Galatians, we acknowledge this morning there have been many subtitles that have been conferred on this great book. Some have called it the Magna Carta of Spiritual Liberty, the battle cry for the Reformation, the Christian's Declaration of independence. This book is a terribly important book. In fact, Martin Luther, many historians will note that it was, it was Martin Luther's writing of his commentary on the book of Galatians that prompted and spearheaded the Great Reformation. You see, many people hold that, that Martin Luther was more inspired by the book of Romans, and that is indeed true when it comes to his own personal salvation and walk with the Lord. But as it results to the Great Reformation of the, of the church, Galatians was really a book that was very influential in Martin Luther's life. So influential that he said this about it. He says, the, the epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. He says, to it I am, as it were, in wedlock. Galatians is my Catherine right? Galatians was a book that, that just brought it into focus for him, and, and certainly is a book that, that helps bring it into focus for us. And so as we consider what Paul says to the church, notice here, it's not just one church, it's to all the churches in the region, several churches that Paul and Barnabas had visited on Paul's first missionary journey, 
uh, to, to what is now known as Turkey. It's here that Paul discovers how ready the Gentile population was to receive the gospel. And in light of the readiness of the people to receive the gospel, he needed to come in and help clarify, help purify, help, help restore a proper perspective of the gospel message. Let's read together what he says here in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, to all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. This is his introduction. It's me, it's Paul. I'm writing, and I'm writing not on the authority of man, but on the authority of Almighty God himself. And we're going to see that authority uh, spelled out just a little bit further in the upcoming weeks. But, but here's what he says. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father to whom to whom be glory forever and ever amen now friends if you've studied the work of Paul you understand that Paul oftentimes will write a letter to a church and he'll spend time in the very beginning portions of that letter praising them for the things that they have done well and and admonishing them and encouraging them that's all the encouragement you get there. Grace and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, for he has rescued us from our sin. He has, he has brought us new hope and life, and to him forever be glory and praise and honor forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Now, I hope you feel encouraged because here, here's where the, the, the real problem comes in. He says in verse 6, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you by grace, by the grace of Christ, and are turning to to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. See, he, he's come to a truth that, that he uh, brings forth to us that we need to not gloss over. You have on one side the gospel truth, and then on the other side you have everything else, right? And there is nothing on this side that is allowed to be on this side right? The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation comes to all men by grace through faith. That's it, all right? And he says, there are some who are, who are turning to a different gospel, and because you turn to a different gospel, we acknowledge that that different gospel is not really even a gospel at all. Evidently, some are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, exclamation point. As we have already said, so now I say it again, just in the event that you missed it. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul brings a message to the people regarding the the authenticity, if you will, of the gospel message. And those who are trying to pervert and and, and trying to to, uh, derail that message from taking hold and taking root in the life of the people. But when you look at this passage of Scripture, it becomes very obvious to me that there are are multiple ways that you can respond to the gospel message. And, And Paul says, in light of the good news of the gospel, some choose, and write this down, some choose to delight in the gospel message. He says, I'm writing to you, the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. He graciously extends his favor towards us, Paul says, and so we offer our grace and peace on behalf of God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. From the very outset, he understands and acknowledges the the good news of this message that has brought him from death unto life, grace and peace. Grace, it's the source of our salvation. Peace, it's the result of our salvation. Grace and peace we offer to you on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we need to understand the context by which Paul is writing. He, he is writing to a, a, a scene that is, uh, is best displayed in Acts chapter 15. 
You see, the, the Judaizers were coming into the church at the time, and, and they were bringing a message to the church that was very different than the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were bringing a message of works. And so they were coming into the people, and they were saying to the, the, the new Gentile believers and those who were inquiring of the Lord and, and inquiring of a relationship with the Lord, they were saying something to this in Michael Paraphrase version, all right? Hang with me here. They say this. If you would like to enter into a relationship with God, boy, we would like that for you. However, you need to do a couple of things. Number one, you need to be circumcised. Number two, you need to, you need to uphold all of the, the rituals and the religious ceremonies. You need to follow our set of, of rules. If you want to be found acceptable in the sight of God, then you're going to have to follow what we tell you to follow. All right. Now, Paul is coming in and saying, wait a second. Salvation is not by works. Salvation is by grace alone. You see, the greatest danger to the gospel of grace is the human notion that before God will forgive you, you must do something. You must do something. You must, you must follow a set of rules. And this, this is exactly what the intruders were bringing to the table. They're saying if, if, if you wanted forgiveness, you're going to have to come first through the doors of religion. And what Paul is saying is that's absolutely not the case. And you see, Paul understood the delight that came from the gospel. Because if you'll read the works of Paul, and, and so many times he, he gives us verbiage like this. Notice what he says here. He says, I extend to you grace and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who gave himself, gave of himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. You see, listen, God looked down on us and he sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission to save you. That's what Paul's saying. He sent his son on a rescue mission to save me. I get it, Paul says. And, and if you'll read other passages of scripture, in Ephesians as an example, he says, we are dead in our sins and our transgressions. Now we talk about this imagery a lot and, 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 and the reason we do is because it's so vitally important. Listen, friends, there are degrees of life. Would you agree? There are degrees of life. I'll give you an example. This week at the, uh, at the um, youth lock-in, Sarah and I came up here and we were hanging out with the young people and we were having a great time and noon, or midnight came, excuse me, not noon, midnight came, we dropped the ball, which happened to be a yoga ball, that's what they use in New York City too. We dropped a yoga ball filled with lights, right? We dropped it right on the parking lot, we celebrated the new year. At about one o'clock, if you looked at all of the adults with the exception of Jamie, every one of us adults were sitting on the chair just about half passed out at one o'clock in the morning. All of the kids were up playing all kinds of fun games. Now, in that very room, we had degrees of life represented, right? We had some who were up and at them, and we had some of us that were almost half dead, right? But here's the deal. You don't have degrees of dead, right? You can have degrees of life, but you can't have degrees of dead. When you're dead, you are dead. That's right. You can't be half dead. You're either fully dead or you're not dead, right? That's it. And here's what Paul says. Paul says to the church of, uh, of Ephesus, I am, we are dead. We are dead in our sins and our transgressions, but we've, made, been alive, we've been made alive in Christ. Well, he gets it. You see, he, it's the same notion that he's coming to the church of Galatia with. He's saying, listen, I was, I, we, were, we were in trouble, but God came on a rescue mission for us. And I delight in that. Probably all of you have examples of what it looks like for someone to delight in a gift that you have given them. And maybe no better than the last couple of weeks. Mason was opening a present from his mother and I. And if you follow uh, the Atherton family storyline at all, Mason has just turned two years old and and when he gets a present to unwrap, the joy is un in unwrapping the present. The joy is not in the present itself. And when he notices that everybody in the room is giving their undivided attention to watching him open that present, it becomes a show like I've never seen before. He'll take the present and he'll wrestle the present. He, is, he has taken him, thrown him up above his head. He has tackled it. He, has, he runs back and forth. He gets so excited. It's, it's like a little baby who's done nothing but eat sugar all morning long. And in fact, probably he has. But he gets so excited because when he gets the idea of the, the, the notion that he's getting a gift, he delights in that in a, in a two-year-old sort of way. Well, 
You know, the reality is when you understand how dead we are in our sins and transgressions, when you understand how, how hopeless and helpless we are without Christ, when Christ comes into your life, you understand what it means to delight in the Lord for the very first time, right? So there are some people, and Paul happens to be one of them, who in, the, in, in light of the good news of the gospel delight in the Lord. But then there's a second group of people here that Paul talks about. And he says in light of the good news of the gospel, the second group of people tend to defect. They tend to defect in the light of the gospel. Look with me here in verse 6. He changes his tenor here, and now he's not extending the grace and peace and, 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 and recounting all the joy in that rescue encounter that he had with Almighty God, to whom praise and glory be forever and ever. Now he comes to verse 6, and he says, I am absolutely astonished. The word here, astonished, means bewildered, amazed, shocked, absolutely stunned. He says, I am, I am absolutely shocked that some of you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. You see, this word deserting, it's an interesting word in the Greek language. It's a military word, and it literally means to defect or to desert. It's a, it's, it's, it, it was treated in biblical times much like it is today, but it's as if you're uh, on the battlefield at war and, and you decide to desert the, the army and, and you leave. It's an act of treason, if you will, and in Bible times, punishable by death. Here we find... Paul going to these folks and saying, how quickly you have turned. You have, you have cashed in. You, have, you have, have turned into a traitor. And before the gospel even had time to lose its freshness, you've started looking around for something new. You've started looking around for something better. You have surrendered even without a struggle, he says. How quickly. I'm astonished, Paul says. You've deserted the realities of the gospel. Isaiah speaks of the same notion when he says in the 29th chapter, he says, the Lord says this, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is, uh, of me is made up only of rules taught by men. And he goes on to talk about this, this reality that, that there are really two types of people in the world when it comes to the gospel truth. There are those who feel like they have to earn it, and then there are those that realize they can do nothing to earn it. And those who had been taught the gospel truth, that salvation indeed is by grace through faith alone in the Jesus Christ, have now decided to abandon that and to turn to the ways of men. 